Yo, 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 what is up, my friends? Welcome to World and Word with your favorite co-hosts, Jonathan Brandenburg and Mark the Man Croucher. I am Jonathan Brandenburg, and I am uh, from the beautiful state of Southern California. State of Southern California. Okay, the beautiful region. It's like a whole other state. It is like a whole other state. It. Like, if you go up to the Bay Area, they're like, yeah, I guess we're part of the same state, maybe. It's like, I hear you. So, I am I am from beautiful Southern California here uh, in Rancho Cucamonga, serving uh, Shepherd Hills Lutheran Church. So good to see everybody. Mark, how are you doing today, buddy? Uh, I'm great. I am apparently Mark the Man uh, Croucher, and <laughs> yes, I, I'm doing very well today, actually. Um, refreshed after a good night's sleep. Felt like I got my hair done really nicely today, so oh, yeah, 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 feeling good today. Two cups of coffee. Yeah, let's you, go. You, oh, two cups. Nice, nice. Two cups. You're gonna That's have... actually low for me, honestly speaking. Usually, so, give, I'm me, give me the average. How many? Seven cups. Yeah. Oh, man. Honestly, three to four a day. <laughs> Yeah. Dude. Yeah. Dude. Well, I cannot wait. I am just days away from going out and seeing my good friend, Mark Croucher. Uh, and I'm so excited about that. And drinking at my favorite coffee shop, The Wild Way, in Kansas City. Um, and yes, yeah, I got family in Kansas City as well. But, you know, it's really all about Mark. Um, so just know that. <laughs> Grandma, if you're watching, what it's really don't all believe about me. Is the conversation <laughs> exactly. Tonight. That's what exactly. About. You think you guys think world and word is fun or interesting or intriguing or something? You should put a camera on his. Di- actually, don't ever put a camera on his dining room table mm-hmm. after about 10 p.m., y'all. I'm telling you, it gets it gets oh, wild. Man. It gets wild. So, uh, but we're excited to. Um, Come to you this week. We will not be doing a Thursday this week because, uh, well, that's basically the day I start my vacation. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. But I, once I get out to Mark's house, which will take a little bit of time because we are driving and we're gonna drive through the great state of Texas on our way out there. So we're gonna stop and see some friends out in our beautiful state of Texas. Uh, but the week after that, we are gonna do one. Uh, where I will be in his dining room or his basement or wherever I'm, we're gonna be set up in the studio. And it will be good. But that will all be after the the 4th of July time and everything. So we're going to take about a week and a half off, and then we'll be back on that following Tuesday. I think that's the 7th, Mark, if I remember right. So we'll be back on that time. So it'll be fun. It'll be good. I'm excited, Mark. Excited to see you. I am, too. Hearing you say this actually at the beginning, I was like, oh, that's right. i got to run those lines downstairs. <laughs> <I> know, <right? laughs> to make sure we have access. Gonna, it's a, we're going to end up in some church basement or something, you know, like <clears> – <throat> church closet so be good but it's so good it's so good to see everybody and a shout out to everybody's giving us a shout out kathy paula my mom what's up vicky and susan hello to you all and everybody who's watching a big hello mark what kind of shout outs you got on your end oh, i got a shout out to sherry I already <laughs> gave her some love as she says she's glad to be here with us wild pastors wild. Uh, and several others who are watching so it's mm-hmm. awesome it's awesome all right well we're gonna get into this mark text we are moving on from mark chapter 2 all the way to Mark chapter 9 today. Mark chapter 9. And so I'm going to turn it over to, excuse me, i got a frog in my throat. Um, I'm going to turn it over to my brother Mark to read that, open us up in prayer and read that, because he is the word and I am just the world here. So, uh, because I got my, by the way, I had to show this real quick, just real quick, my power up VBS t-shirt. I'm missing VBS a little bit <laughs> this year. There's no VBS this year uh, due to the circumstances, but I'm kind of missing. So I had to power up the VBS t-shirt. So, all right, Mark, pray for us and get us going on this Mark nine text. You got it. Uh, Lord, we ask that you bless and keep us because our conversation is going to go into some dark waters, uh, some waters that may be a little deep or uncomfortable for us. We're going to talk about doubt, Lord, Uh, the doubts that we have, the doubts that we are aware of. Sometimes, Lord, even the doubts that are made aware as we interact with you, Jesus, and your grace and your truth and your power. Um, So, Lord, watch over us. Guard us and protect us. Let us not be tempted or pulled away from the evil one. Let not distance be created between us and our God, but rather let us be drawn to our God, that recognizing um, in our being brought to him— we find that our doubts are relieved. Even in the presence of doubt, Jesus Christ and his truth stands strong. Bless us then as disciples and followers, as hearers of your word, be present in our conversation, in our study, 
and even in the times that follow after this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, Mark. Mark chapter 9. What verse are we starting with? I'm going to start at verse 14 and go to 27. Again, let's just get the story. There's a little more to the story that continues uh, after 27, but I think we can cut off there at 27. All right, Mark so, Mark 9. So are you, you're going to read you get this. It all you're going to read this, in? but I haven't gotten it typed yeah, in I yet. Yeah, I got it. What? what? All right. <laughs> so Mark I was going to say, I don't see the nine, text boxes popping. What is it? 12? 14. 14. 14 through 20. 27. All right, sorry about that. There it is, right there, guys. Looking awesome. All right, so let's start reading. Let move it down. Uh, NIV, verse 14, coming right off the mountain of transfiguration. Jesus is walking down that mountain with Peter, James, and John. Mm. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, around the other disciples, and the teachers of the law were arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. Mm. What are you arguing with them about? Jesus asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. O oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. The boy fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus then asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, the father answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity, have compassion on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed the boy violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. Here ends our reading from Mark chapter nine. Perfect. All right. All right, Mark. So crazy story. Tons of context coming off a huge event like the Transfiguration, coming off of, of that interaction, but then coming down right into the action. Like it is fascinating for me. If I, if I was thinking about it, this as a movie, it would be like a Star Wars movie, which is, is fascinating for me where they always do that weird like clock you know, transition, like, shoo, like the thing comes off. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. But anyway, that's a weird transition. It's just a Star Wars thing. And it's always from, it's this really intense action, and then they'll give you a little bit of time to process. And all of a sudden, here comes the clock, and you're switching right into, like, um, you're halfway across the galaxy, and there's, like, gunships everywhere. And you're like, what's going on? And, and that's sort of the brilliance behind Star Wars. The brilliance behind this writing is we're coming off, we're just getting sort of the denouement, if you were. We're getting the sort of come down from Transfiguration. You're like, so what now? Like, you know, uh, Peter, James, and John is up there. Like, we'll pitch a tent. No, never mind. Anyway, we get all that. We come into this. Why? Why, Mark? Give us some more context. Give us a little bit of the context around it. But why is the, why are we bringing it from Transfiguration time to hear and especially this concept of doubt that you and I want to work with pretty pretty closely here what how does that play into it give us some more context why the transition like this and how does doubt play into it all all right so yeah <laughs> you're right about the context and it's going to take us a little bit to get there right. but it's important to follow the steps you're right so we're up on the mountain of transfiguration peter james and john with jesus um, they've just seen Jesus in all his heavenly glory. The father's made this comment. Listen to him, right? My son, I love him. Listen to what he has to say. Um, 
Peter gets this idea, hey, let's stay here forever. This is great. You and your glory, let's do this. Right. But the glory of God has come into this rule and reign of God into the world has come not to serve the purpose of living on a mountain quietly forever in this joy and excitement, but actually to come down into the brokenness of the world, right? right. What a beautiful picture. On a mountain, down into where the people live, uh, where the people are, and bringing this glory. Now, when they're coming down the mountain, and Peter's got a bit of a rebuke, right? He's been told, hey, nah, we're not staying here. This is not how this is going to end. Um, the disciples seemingly are following Jesus, and they're told, don't say a word. Shh, keep, keep quiet, right? right? Don't tell anybody who I am. So they're walking down this mountain, and they hear an argument. It's as if you can see it from far off, right? right. They're all right. fighting in this ring, and there's a circle <laughs> around the disciples. And, and, and Jesus is walking up to it. When they see Jesus, the people are like, oh, it's Jesus. Ah, they come running to Jesus. Yeah. What's going on? What are you arguing about? Now, we don't hear the words, but if you were to guess, given what we had heard in Mark 9, what was happening, you can almost sense that what has happened is a father, a loving, caring father, mm. has brought his child, his son, who is suffering gravely at the hands of a demon, right, of a possession. Right. Um, all these horrible things are happening to his body. And while he finds himself being brought to the disciples, who have, we've read in Mark, cast out demons before yep. and been given the power to do so by Christ himself, the authority yep. to do so, they, for whatever reason, can't cast this demon out. Now, you find out <laughs> a little bit later in the reading, Jesus explains some more detail, which we didn't read to. So if you want to know that, you can go right. read the following right. verse 28 and so on. Um, but but – They've they've tried to cast out this demon, right? So be gone, right? Get leave this boy. Um, mm -hmm. They've done this thing, and it didn't work. And the fair the scribes um, are there uh, of the law, and they're around him. You can almost picture them just picking at the disciples now, right? Like, oh come on, come on, what's the problem? Can't you do this? I thought you guys were all powerful. I thought you guys had the ability to overcome. Didn't your master say you could? Right. Ooh, maybe your master's power is limiting. Oh, maybe this isn't as strong as we thought. So already they're feeding doubt into right. the disciples right. who no doubt themselves are already doubting themselves. We've done this before. Why can't right. we do this now? Right. The crowd is encircling them. I mean, you just the mayhem and chaos of the scene is unbelievable to, to think about. And then Jesus walks in the midst of it. Yep. What's yep. going on? What are you arguing about? And out of this crowd, this mass, steps one man. Boom, boom, boom. It's the dad. And he says, I brought my boy to your disciples, to you, mm. and you weren't here. So I brought them to your disciples, and they couldn't cast out the demon. Mm. That, that's where all this doubt is coming from. We've got an argument, and all sides are feeding doubt into the uh, the minds of those who are present. And right. in the midst of all this doubt, Jesus steps right in. Right. And I, right in the middle. And exactly. Exactly. And Mark and I were talking before we started here today, and it was like, I, 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 it may not be the most accurate description, but I said it's a fear of being out of control or the uh, the actualness of being out of control, where I think is the sort of the, the bed of doubt. Because you got Peter, James, and John, who are the invited, were the insiders, if you will, the favorites of Jesus, who just come off of a mountain going, what was that all? I mean, we saw this and saw, but then they did, I, I, I said something about a tent and it didn't work out. And, you know, so, so we come, they're coming off and they're still processing all that. They don't really get it. Um, and then you get an argument right away. And I love how Mark describes that. It's the scribes are like, oh, you think you know everybody? Because we're coming to the tail end of Mark. Mark is not a long, uh, yeah. long, long book at all. So we're already past the halfway mark. Lots of things have happened. And yep. and and you got the scribes going, Well, you know, maybe you just ain't what you thought you were, you know. And especially when Jesus ain't around, you ain't that I mean, there's some serious like, yeah. oh, and I, I love how Mark is like, Oh, how'd you do it, Mark? You have to do the impression like of the disciples trying to cast out the demon from from like, I don't know. Come, like, come on, just, like, get out. Exactly, please. Exactly, I, please get out. Think about that. Think about the desperation that would enter you, especially Seriously. if you say control. 
if you've done this before and now it's not working, there's that moment of embarrassment, right? Mm -hmm. <gasps> What's happening? What happened? Right? Oh, yeah. That, it, right. That's a terrifying experience. You're right. Right. So you got the confusion of the, the three disciples coming back who are sort of the top disciples, the desperation and, and almost hu humiliation of the disciples who cannot oh, yeah. cast this out. And then couple that with the desperation, probably frustration, anger, maybe even, or just sadness of this dad. And it, <clears throat> and it all culminates in like, we don't know what's going on here. We don't know what's going to happen next. And gosh dang it, why didn't this work? And gosh dang it, 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 it should have, something should be happening because my boys, I mean, I love this because it really, I don't know about you. Have you guys felt a little out of control lately? <laughs> A little frustrated or desperate, or they're like, "Can we just get a grip? Can we just find yeah. some solid ground for a second, right?" And and I think that's playing at least a, a cadence of that is playing here, and that's why we said yeah. it's so important to understand the context because the context, while it looks really different on the surface, you pick below the surface and you're like, "Oh, yeah, yeah, that actually sounds very familiar in my life." And so Jesus steps in. So I love how you said this, Mark. So Jesus steps right in. And so what does he do? Is it is it important? I was I, I should have asked you this before, so I apologize if it takes you out. But is it important that he, Jesus, who seems to know everything, right? You know, always seem to know, that he asks, what are you guys arguing about? Is it is it is it important this sort of like entry, or is it or is it more important, probably is, um, more important to say this whole faithless generation. It seems like such a passive aggressive move for me. It's like it's like a, a really good like, oh my gosh. Okay, bring him. Right. <laughs> right? But how do how how do you see that? How do you translate that? Is what's important, what's maybe not as important in all of that initial interaction of Jesus stepping into this doubt, this out of control, this desperation, humiliation, confusion. So I, I think part of it is, you know, he's he's not too long ago in Mark, if I remember correctly, he's kind of made this conversation known. Um, yeah. Uh, if you confess me before men, I'll confess yep. you before my father in heaven. If you don't confess me. So there's I think there's probably a little bit of that working in Jesus. Right. Like, come on, here I am. You disciples have been doing this. Um, you've been confessing and preaching and proclaiming my name. Yep. And now all of a sudden I come down. I, it, it, I, I guess I, I liken it to like, you know. I've been gone for two hours, <laughs> right, right. Gone, right? But I just stepped away, and and things are just out of control. And so I come back down, like you got to be kidding me. Yeah. Why is it that things just can't keep moving? And I think anybody who's in a position of leadership in a home, um, in, in a church, in a school, wherever it, wherever you find yourself at work, uh, this idea of being um, having having given authority and discharged it. Now all of a sudden people can't, they can't seem to keep it together. Right. And I think there's a part of that exasperation that comes out of Christ. That's, that's, that's expressed. Um, but pause, right, it pa does, it does pause, feel... pause right there, Mark. Can, can you say officially on air to everybody that it actually oh, is not a sin to feel exasperated? I think I could. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just, it just hit me as soon as you said, it, it was like, I always yeah. get mad at myself when I'm like, oh, you're losing patience and you're, but wait a second, Jesus did that. And, and, and like, you, I love how you said it because every leader who's ever existed, you know, in any sort of leadership role has felt this way. And I think, well, Jesus actually did express a, an actual grab, you know, tangible, that's the word I'm looking at, tangible, real, oh, faithless generation. He got kind of like, ugh. Folks, really? I like how you say I'm going to go with two hours. Live for two hours and you can't deal, right? And yeah. and that right there is not the sinful part. That would not there would not be the whole, you know, to express it in the way that's even into their face, by the way. This isn't to the side venting to a friend, going back to our Matthew 18 um, time. But, but it right. is interesting that Jesus would take this. It's almost for me... Uh, in that same genre of the flipping over the tables, there is a righteous angle, but we rarely get it right. I guess there is a righteous exasperation, but we probably rarely get it right as well. I don't know. Well, 
And I, I think it is because our, I think largely ex- exasperation, if we're not careful, leads us down the road of being it didn't go my way. Right. Or it's right. not going my way. Right. Which is a very selfish reality. Yeah. Uh, but I do think that, like you say, there's a righteous exasperation that can come out when we sit here and we're going, we know God's word. We know God's rule in this world. And yet we're ignoring it or we're right. or we're blinded by it at this point for right. whatever reason. Um because of temptation or trial or whatever, we're, we're, we're pulled away from what's really going on. Right. Um, so yeah, I, the but but Jesus' exclamation of all this, I don't I don't think he's I don't think it's intended to be this great um, crushing force upon us. Mm-hmm. Um, but more again, just that expression of his maybe even a little disappointment of sorts. You know, mm-hmm. hey, come on, come on, this is here. You have the authority, and and again, it's all wrapped up in this idea of unbelief. Um, that everybody there is struggling with, which right. I, I think is important for us today too, because we wrestle with unbelief, whether we want to admit it or not. But I, I, I actually, it's hard for me because there's so much guilt and shame, um, remorse wrapped up with doubt that like, you don't even want to admit it. You're like, no, no, it's not doubting. I'm just like, you know, I'm a little unsure. Well, that sounds like mm. doubt. Well, it, it's different. It's different <laughs> because we don't, we don't want to admit it. I mean, doubt is a heavy word. Um, and yet I believe that this text has doubt just laying right under the surface. That emotion is everywhere. Right. So, yeah. No, exactly. And you know I did a, a three-week sermon series on doubt foolishly um, at the earlier, this, earlier this year. And, um, but it, it is. It is. How do I? This is, this is where we're really going to see if we go how deep the, through the grass and the weeds and the thicket <laughs> are we going to go here. But I think there is a... I would argue for the necessity of doubt. Now let me let me let me back that up, and I'm going to throw it off to Mark to deal with the father's response because Mark has some really great insight. Again, this can, context has to be there. It says doubt facilitates better questions, and doubt facilitates deeper, and it's desperate. I think that is a great word, but a desperate yearning for something that's beyond itself. So if I doubt um, a, a situation, even say I doubt God, let's give it the ultimate high level doubt. If I doubt God, there is this moment of then saying faith is going to take over and say, yeah, you doubt God from this perspective, from my Jonathan Brandenburg's perspective. And yet, are you still going to believe in him? It's going to welcome me. It's going to invite me into, yet are you still going to believe in him? Are you still going to trust that something is going to happen, that he's still the, that Jesus is Lord, or that something's going to happen in this circumstance, whether it's what your expectation is or not? Or doubt is going to invite us into this space of saying, God can't be trusted. I mean, it can also invite us into the space of like, well, you've said your thing and you've done your part. God hasn't done your his part. But again, all that for me is saying it's just revealing more of my expectations. An um, unmet expectation will either lead me into faith or more more expectations, frankly, which I think leads to bitterness overall or ultimately not trusting. So having said that, though, the father's response, I think, reveals that Mark kind of unpack the father's response a little bit for us on that one. Cause you, yeah, you have a good one. You have <laughs> a right. good one on this and we're both dads. So we both really get this on a very real level too. Oh yeah. I mean, to me, this is one of the most heart wrenching pictures of scripture and you said it off air. And so here it is back on, I'll throw it back out there. We can talk about it later perhaps, but the, the relationship, the seeming connection between this story of the father with his son and, and the Syrophoenician woman uh, with her child. I mean, th- th- there's there's something that's drawing these together, and it's more than just its parents and children. But um, for <laughs> we're just coming off Father's Day too. The right. thought of a father who, no doubt, has done whatever he can. I mean, he's he's at the point of bringing this child to Jesus, so he's he's open to anything that's going to bring healing to his son. Right. And as we find out in his conversation with Jesus, this child's been having this, these symptoms, this, this reaction from this possession since childhood, right? Yep. Since forever. Like it's always been there to the point it's tried to kill him. Right. It's thrown the boy into fire. It's thrown him into water by God's grace though. This child has always been rescued and you can almost imagine very likely by the father himself. I mean, think of the trauma he's gone through, not just witnessing it, but putting himself then into fire 
or into water to rescue his own son. I mean, right? again, it, it's it, it, it's us imagining it at some level, but you can you you got to see this at some level. This is the links right. that parents go for their children, you know. And so he, here he is looking at Jesus. He's I love it. Like here is the crowd all there, mm-hmm. and all these accusations are flying, and Jesus just asks this question: What are you arguing about? Well, of course he knows, but what are you arguing about? And the dad steps forward. Look, the disciples don't, well, 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 we couldn't, we tried. The the, the scribes don't step up and go, oh, you want to hear a funny story? Right. Your boys over here couldn't handle this one. Yeah, that's great. Um, the the crowd doesn't come in and go, oh, wow, this is a great one going on. we got over here in this corner and over here in this corner. No, it's the dad who immediately takes charge, steps up. I have a son. I brought him to you. You weren't here. So your disciples tried. They couldn't do it. I, I mean, I witnessed an attempt and it didn't work again, again, again. And the dad says, if, and I love it, if you're able, have compassion, take pity on us and help us. Now, you, you can be pushy with the dad and be like, if, come on, because Jesus seemingly takes that route. If, right. I can help you. What if? What? But think about this. The dad just watched it not happen in front of his face. Right. He just watched the disciples try. And now he's got ringing in his ears his own doubts, his own concerns, whatever the disciples might have said or or shown in their their desperation when it didn't work out. Right. Whatever these scribes – like it's just been echoing. It's this big echo chamber of doubt and it's not going to work. It's not going to happen again. And the dad is just sitting there. What am I going to do? And when – Jesus says, bring the boy to me. Oh, my gosh. This to me is where it gets to the extreme of heart wrenching. I mean, Mm. the level is just almost too much for me to bear. Even brings tears to my eyes when I think about it. Because right there in front of Jesus, to show Satan's uh, and, and evil's desire to just torment even Christ and all of humanity it sends the boy into convulsions mm. right then and there, right in front of Jesus, right in front of the father, right in front of the crowd. The boy has brought to Jesus and then look at evil's just desire to just just, oh, you love this creation. Watch what I will do to it and just brings this heart rate heartbreak. Mm. And in the midst of that, Jesus begins to question the dad. How long has he been like this? Oh, well, Jesus, since he was a child, can we get on with it? Yep. Oh, really? Tell me more, right? And you have this moment. The, his son is on the ground in this fit, in this convulsion. And, yep. and and he's looking at Jesus, and he says, if you can. And Jesus then wants to go further. If I can? Yeah, you know, for those who believe anything is possible. The dad is at his wit's end. What's this he going to say? He just looks at Jesus and says, I do believe. Help me with my unbelief, right? right? I, Something's going on here inside of me. I believe you can you can heal him. That's why I brought him here. But you're right. I'm struggling and right. I need it. And that that whole story just slays me, man. It just gets me. Right. No, I totally agree. I totally agree. And and there's such a weird story too, because there's no, oh, your faith or your exclamation has made you better or anything like that. No, no tags here. Not even at the very end, which is just fascinating to me. Um, but, but I totally agree with Mark. My read on this guys is so much that doubt is, is there to ultimately draw you in away from the expectations, away from what you are demanding or asking or pleading for. And and he says, I want, and Mark said it off the air. So I'll, I'll just say it for him. I want you. That's what I want. The ultimate expression of God's power on earth is not a miracle. Which is really hard to say because, frankly, we all want miracles. I want a miracle. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Mark wants a miracle. As dads, we want a miracle for this dad. You know, we're all rooting for a particular outcome. And yet Jesus is always rooting for a particular outcome, and it's called you. Yeah, it's called us, right? Exactly. And that's what doubt brings together. Our expectations of an outcome, our expectation of what's going on, and it cross references over Jesus's outcome, us, and, he, and and that's where there should be doubt. That's where faith has to have some sort of doubt or exclamation. And I really love this exclamation. I believe 
bring uh, the the Hebrew the Greek word here because I'm a total geek at times. I looked it up. Is actually from an old Greek word that means to run to the aid of, and that's why it's just usually translated help or aid or yes. um, secure. I don't know. Secure comes from it's the old word secure. Anyway, but not secure, but socor. You know. Anyway, um, but it's run to the aid of. I do believe. My unbelief needs aid. My unbelief is crying out for help, guidance, whatever you want to say. And Jesus, yeah. and, and it's this moment where Jesus says, that's where I need you. Because again, my off quoted from, from Catholic priest, uh, a Catholic priest, Richard Rohr, it says the opposite of faith is not doubt. Oh, the yeah. opposite of faith is certainty. And, and I just, mm-hmm. that's where it's at for me is, is we know what this dad wants for the, for his boys, for his outcomes, what Mark and I would want for our children's outcome if they were facing this kind of destructive force, like how you described that, Mark. Uh, but Jesus wants to talk first. He wants, like, Dad, I need to chat with you first. And it's and we were talking about it's really parallel in many ways to the Syrophoenician or the, or the yeah. Canaan, Canaan woman as well. So, Mark, we're, we don't get kind of a bow on this one. What are we to make of that? I mean, obviously, the corpse is a weird thing, like lies down. The boy's like a corpse. Everybody's to the point mm-hmm. where these people have seen dead people. Y'all and I haven't yeah. seen them, but dead people. We're mm-hmm. pastors, so we see it every once in a while. But really, these people walk across dead people all the time. That's first century Judea for you. Um, but And so they're all convinced. And then he reaches out, and he brings them up, and, and all this kind of stuff. But that's the end of the story. And And, 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 and there's no like... I don't want you to talk about it there, and I'm not even going to get into verse 29. I'm so glad you didn't read that. <laughs> so I'm just not even going to go there, <laughs> but the story really wraps up in a weird way. Why, why is that Mark? What are we, what are we to make of that as we kind of wind this thing up at the end here? Oh, dang it. I'm wishing we had more time. Yeah. No. Um, I, I think, I, I think, and there, it's, again, like you say, it's the reason we kind of stopped where we did um, because there is a little more to this story, but it, it is powerful that, they seem as though he's dead, right? right. The, the child is dead. But as much as as much as Jesus doesn't have what we may expect or may have heard in other stories, there is one unique thing that I, I noted as I was doing some some research and work on this one, and that is he does say something unique to this child uh, or to this demon who has uh, uh, possessed his child. He says, right. "Do not ever yes. come back into them." Yes, which I. Yeah. So, yeah. so we don't always hear that, right? We, we don't always hear. We, he casts out demons. Um, and Jesus even has this conversation. I believe it's in Matthew, right? Mm-hmm. Where he says, um, you know, the demon leaves and the house is swept clean, but then he brings back even yes. more. Uh, yes. when he comes back. Uh, but in this case, I think it's powerful that he, he looks at the child, which I think is one of these things that, that brings us back to Christ's love. I mean, uh, uh, Mark chapter 10 is going to talk about Jesus' right. love for the children, right? right? And the welcoming of them. And in this story, just before that, with the child, he says, don't ever come back into him. So we've witnessed this 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 traumatic moment for this child, for this father. And yet it's not it's the authority of Christ that's given right. and even greater. Um, right. Uh, that goes further. Uh, right. But I but I do think that, again, we're, oh, we're closing up here, but no, you're fine. There is power in, like you said, that. What Jesus wants is us. And dad, we got to have a conversation. I think one of the fears in doubt is, again, I use those words, guilt, shame, remorse, that too often um, doubt has such a negative connotation to it. Mm. I mean, not to get into the story, but doubting Thomas is used as a phrase right. to um, not speak of a positive situation, yep. right? It's to talk about us. When we're in a negative place, you doubting right. Thomas, you unbelieving person, right. shame on you, shame on you, you know, right. um, when the truth of the matter is there's doubt all over scripture, even in Matthew 28, when we're about to hear the great commission, it's even says in there, here the come the people to see Jesus. And yet some were still doubting, doubting. right? Yep. Even, even then he's still, da- there's still doubt involved. Yep. So we, we. I think we need to wrestle with the fact, on the one hand, that doubt is here, right? It's here. And like you said, doubt serves a purpose. Guilt serves a purpose, too. Guilt guilt right. drives us to say, what I've done is wrong, right. and, and how do I get rid of the guilt? And when the doubt is here, what do I do? And I would say that in this text, one of the big things to focus on is that the doubt is present. The dad mm. doesn't hide it. He doesn't run from it. He brings it right up to Jesus 
and literally throws it out at him. Just spews it and spits it. Yep. I believe. Help me with my unbelief. Right. Aid me. Ble- you know, fix this thing in me. Come <laughs> to my knee for the right. fact that I can't. I can't stop the doubt. And and I think pointing that out to us and giving ourselves a break. Doubt is there. Admit yeah. it. Realize it's there. But also recognize its purpose. Right. Its purpose, like you said before, it draws us back to Christ, which is exactly what the disciple, the follower of Jesus does. We come to Jesus because we recognize in whatever these moments are in our lives, in whatever we're doubting, doubting ourselves, uh, doubting our ability to succeed in our careers, doubting um, the relationships that we have with our family and friends, um, doubting the illnesses, the sicknesses, the the, the deterioration of our own bodies, um, doubting that God even cares about that, mm-hmm. coming to him and saying, oh, Lord, in my in my pain, in my struggle, help me. All right? yeah. I believe in you, which is why I bring my doubt to you. Yes. I believe yes. that you have this power to work even in the midst of my doubt. You may not bring, like you said, all, the full extent of my expectations. Right. This father gets that, and praise be to God for it. But sometimes, sometimes we don't get our full expectations met, but we are nevertheless drawn closer to Christ. Yeah, which again is what the evil one wanted to stop in the beginning, which is right. why the child, in my thought, my in my opinion, that's why the child went through such an extreme torment right there at the feet of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yep. No, I agree. I to push down. <clears throat> no, no, no. You're good. I, I I totally agree. And and just to go on the minority report here for a second, um, if you're not doubting, that's okay. But don't start the argument like the scribes did. Because oh, I've heard yeah. this a lot, and I get it. And again, not everybody's in the same part. Mark and I very much understand this. Like, everybody is in a slightly different space with Jesus and travel. We travel communally, but we don't always act communally. And so while we're kind of traveling down this road of faith, there are times, and I've seen it, where people have raised valid questions, or what's even call them invalid mm-hmm. You know, because we could easily just dismiss the dad of saying, it's invalid. You should trust Jesus because he's Jesus, right? Some sort of artificial framework that we put on the text. And I think that artificial framework is easy to say, well, why are you doubting this? Just believe simple faith and come up. And I'm like, well, you just, you were described. There's no Jesus here. They're starting an argument. They're starting a sort of a judgmental mm-hmm. space. And I think in a lot of ways, Mark and I have both come out of a generation that has mostly left the church. And I think we keep hearing stories of sort of shame or stories of fear or stories that come out of when they doubted and they spoke it openly like this dad disc is going to, I love how Mark said it, just put it out there. The church didn't act like Jesus. The church acted like the scribes. And and I think that is such a, 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 a space. How do we cultivate a doubt-friendly environment that is still passionate about what we believe in Christ? Can we, as the church, or even us individuals, like Mark has cultivated, Mark and Heather has cultivated a kitchen, dining room, doubt-friendly environment. <laughs> I will tell you that, right? I will, I will bear witness to the doubt-friendly environment that Mark has created, cultivated, that makes us such good friends because I am very much a doubter in so many ways uh, about a lot of things. And so how can the church extend that table? How can the church extend that space to where we even say, oh, faithless generation, come on, right? This shouldn't be a big one for you. But at the same time, say, bring me the boy. You know, bring it on. Let's do this. And then when the doubts come, what do we do? We build relationships. You know, we build the connections, right? It's not so much about having the right answer. And I think that's what the church is worried about. These are valid. Some of these doubts are very valid and there is no answer to it. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And so let's try to avoid being the scribes, my friends. Let's try to really cultivate this doubt friendly even in our exasperation or frustration or i don't know what to do with this doubt because i don't have them it's fine bring me the boy bring it on let's do this so that's that's my left field uh i was like i want to talk about the scribes for a second (laughs) so well no i i like that though because that that was one of the things that i you know again in in my conversation with uh the word as i was walking through it too 
I recognize that. And my honest thought was, how many times in my doubts, who are the voices of these scribes, right? Right, right. That the, that the doubt isn't necessarily always me. It's the doubts that have been put into my ear by others or mm-hmm. that I've heard or that I'm listening to. And they just continue to wear on me. I, yeah, I think you're right on there. Yeah. I think that's I think that's important, yeah. And there's all sorts of different scribes, by the way. You can become a scribe <laughs> in, in a lot of different ways, y'all. So don't. Uh, if you know your scribe, great. If you know your in, inner scribe, even better. Um, so, but that can that sort of uh, that sort of can happen in a lot of different ways. So, all right, Mark. Well, that is roughly our time. But I want to give us a little time to wrap this up and a little time to wind it down. So, final shout out, final word. Um, as we take about a week and a half break here, what do we want to, what do we want to give? I know, right? It's not a lot of pressure, just a little. <laughs> so, so Mark, how do we, where do you want to wrap this up? Where do you want to do your final shout outs? Go for it, my man. Have no doubts. We'll be back. <laughs> that, we're, not, Hit the subscribe I'm not button. Done, but Hit I the just... subscribe button. <laughs> <laughs> Notifications on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so so have no doubts we'll be back. But uh, no, I, I think I think the biggest thing that I take away from this and in the doubts that we experience in our lives, um, you see it here with this father, and you see it again with Thomas specifically. And that is, and and I and I really mean this, our doubts are never too big for Jesus. Mm. Never too mm. big for Jesus. And in the face of our doubts, Jesus draws nearer. He draws near to the Father, to the Son, right? He comes to them in the argument. They come out of the crowd, and he again bring the boy to me. Um, you can only imagine the Father is even closer now at this point. Right. I, I, with Thomas, you come in and you touch it, man. You get right in there and you touch the wound, if that's what you got to do. Jesus draws near to us in the midst of our doubts. Mm. Um, and in that, he shows that his love covers all things. And I, I think that's important. And not to let the doubts that we have push us away because like you say how terrible is it when the church is the voice um the people of god even become a voice that speaks Mm. doubt to us Uh, but even when it does god will draw near right christ draws near to our doubts and he brings his presence he brings his love no it's beautiful thanks mark um i'm gonna build off of marks and say um not only will god approach us and be there and interact with us in our doubts sometimes and i do believe this sometimes god creates situations of doubt to deepen us to 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 put spaces in our world to say i need i want to deepen this so i'm going to put you into a time and we and the biblical uh space there is usually a wilderness but what more is a wilderness than a time of temptation or a time of saying uh, you know, uh, doubting the trust or doubting the uh, presence or doubting the, the kindness or doubting the generosity or doubting the goodness of God, right? Uh, of the Father that walks with us. So um, sometimes the wilderness, actually, uh, many times, more times than I want to admit, the wilderness or the doubt journey is a necessary faith journey. And so don't, um, don't lose heart, like Mark was saying, that God is still interacting with you, that God is still working with us in those times of wilderness or doubt journeys. And to do with the, take a cue from the father. I mean, take a cue from the, our, our, the, the earthly father here and just lay it on the line. I, I, I believe, but dude, I got yeah. unbelief that yeah. needs help as well. You know, like I love it. And I think that is just such a great, when you don't know it's a prayer, when you're shutting down because the world is on fire right now, uh, politically and culturally and all this, when everything just seems crazy say god i still believe in you but man my unbelief my doubt my fears my whatever they need some help they need some aid right now guide me and he will yes he absolutely will and and he might and and in like jesus even said i think is a really great uh thing going oh faithless generation guys we are in a time where where people don't turn the faith people don't people turn to a lot of things for change for revolution Mm -hmm. for reform Guys, we can we can be that that space where faith can be those spaces of reform, of change, of revolution once again. And so, in that doubt, is a catalyst for that as well. So, that's a long time. So, let's, let's I'm, I'm going to get off topic. But in a, in a final shout out to just everybody who supports uh, World and Word, we really do appreciate it. I don't know how long it will go on, um, and so, uh, but. 
we're going to try to keep it going as long as we can. There's a lot of reopening in Mark and I's world. There's a lot of things that are happening in those times, but we're going to try to keep it going. Uh, so just keep... Uh, Keep uh, the encouragement, share it with your friends. Uh, if you have ideas for topics, we would love to hear that. Um, yes. And then, yeah. And then next time you see us, I will be somewhere in the same room with Mark, uh, probably wearing a mask on just for my California friends. <laughs> just for a second. Just come on oh, with a ma mask you. on. Just, just for my California friends. Solidarity of, of us who have to walk around with a mask all the time on. Um, and so, I know. It's all the You got to say thank you to Ben Sounds. Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Ben Sound. Woo. We do love your sweet, beautiful sounds, Ben Sound. So thank you so much for all that and for keeping the lawyers away. We appreciate you. So close. Right. So close. Thank you, Mark. That's why you're there for me, buddy. That's why you're there. All right, y'all. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you in a week and a half. Until then, stay safe, stay sane, stay knowing that God very much loves you still. Adios, my friends. Bye. <laughs>